Welcome to the Critical Practices Talks. I am Carolina Gitu, Professor of Creative Practice Research at the Center for Arts, Memory and Communities at Coventry University. The Critical Practices Talks are a series of monthly conversations uh, to shed light on the capacities of practice to produce knowledge, advance critical inquiries and intervene in society. I've hosted conversations with researchers and practitioners in the fields of art, curating, critical theory and museum studies, including Wayne Modest, uh, Beatrice von Bismarck and uh, Sepake Angiama. Today we have for this in conversation, the sociologist and writer Rolando Vasquez to explore the aesthetic, the aesthetic territory of modernity as the control, and I'm quoting, of representation and the framing of experience. And I think this conversation will be a very nice segue from our latest conversation with Wayne Modest, uh, where we were discussing uh, critical museum practices and ethnographic museums, especially in the context of Europe, and also issues around repair and care in material cultures. So uh, Rolando Vasquez is Associate Professor of Sociology at University College Roosevelt and Cluster Chair at University College Utrecht. Both of these colleges are part of the University of Utrecht. He's author of Vistas of Modernity, Decolonialized Thesis, and the End of the Contemporary. And this is a publication I have here with me today. And we will be discussing a little bit more in detail this publication that was published last year, so 2020, by the Mondrian Fund. Together with uh, Walter Mignolo, uh, Rolando Vasquez founded and co-directs since 2010, the annual Middleburg uh, the Colonial Summer School, now located at the Van Abe Museum in Eindhoven, also in the Netherlands. Vasquez co-authored the report of the Diversity Commission for uh, the University of Amsterdam, and this was in 2016, under the direction of uh, Gloria Wecker. Um, also, uh, through his work, uh, Rolando seeks to decolonize cultural and educational institutions beyond the dominant frameworks of contemporaneity, heteronormativity, and coloniality. His research on the question of precedence and relational temporalities seeks to overcome the Western critique of modernity and contribute to the ongoing efforts to decolonize knowledge, aesthetics, and subjectivity. It's also important to note that Vasquez is a prolific writer and author and has written extensively on these topics and also the ones we will discuss today. So Rolando, thank you so much for accepting the invitation and being here today with me. It's been like uh, incredibly thought provoking to be in conversation with you also for the last uh, roughly four years. Um, and I hope this conversation will be part of that ongoing um, exchange. Um, so to start with, and as I said, I would like very much to focus on uh, some of the points you make in your latest publication in relation to the aesthetic territories of modernity. But before we get there, um, there's, uh, I would like to ask you a question more in terms of the, what is the conceptual framework where you situate this, this, this discussion around aesthetics uh, display and also representation. And in this publication, and also in your other writings, uh, you define the coloniality as an option for thinking and doing beyond the dominant paradigm. And, and this dominant paradigm, as, you've been as you have described together with also other colleagues from mainly Latin America and here necessarily Anibal Quijano, but also Barton Mignolo and Dussel, et cetera, uh, you have described this as modernity coloniality or modernity slash coloniality. Uh, this is quite a key term for your thinking and for the work you've been doing. Um, 
And I wanted to ask you if you could outline the main underpinnings of this paradigm and how it relates to a key notion that you also present in the publication that is colonial difference. Thank you, Carolina. I'm really glad to be in this conversation. Um, it is, um, I think this is a really important topic today. So I'm glad to speak about it. Um, okay, let me start by saying that that not every critique is a decolonial critique. I think that is something that I often have to explain because people are today using decolonial terminology without really knowing what it is about. And sometimes they use it as a synonym of uh, deconstruction or critical thinking, thinking in the Marxist terms of critical thinking or, or the like, or as the post-colonial. So, what I would like to highlight is that not every critique is a decolonial critique, and and this is why, right? So I will explain explain the tenets of what uh, what in our view sustains the decolonial, coming from this long trajectory from Apiayala from Latin America um, that has been made that has been in the making for many decades and we could argue since the colonial encounter but of course very strongly as as theoretical thinking in social sciences since the 60s uh, we have this very strong movement to uh, overcome eurocentrism in thinking and doing uh, so what are the main tenets i mean i have to say that one characteristic of the colonial thought is that it is not centralized. It's not like Marxist thought or Gramscian thought or uh, Foucault or Deleuze. It is not one author's own territory. <laughs> it is not the own ownership of the territory or the sovereignty of one author. So the coloniality is, a, is an open network of people, scholars, activists, artists, that uh, that approach it in their own way, and there is no central authority anywhere. I think this is really important to highlight because there is no one person that has the ultimate word. We never say, uh, "Mignolo said this, and you cannot say the contrary," or "Gigano said that, and you cannot say the contrary." That's something we never do, right? And that I think speaks already to the way we do things differently. Now, this said, we do have certain tenets that are fundamental and in which we agree generally. And I think, so first, uh, I will start with the most basic and is that the colonial critique has to engage with the colonial wound. So our work, our practice and thinking is about engaging with the colonial wound is about justice and healing. And uh, so if you are practice, if you are using conceptual tools of decoloniality just for the exercise of knowing more, that's not decoloniality. And decoloniality has an ethics and has a political orientation. And that is, I think, fundamental. And so, for example, many artists that might not know all the theoretical framework, but are engaged with the colonial wound and are concerned with healing the colonial wound uh, or with a task of justice, of ancestral justice, are doing a decolonial movement and and they don't need to call themselves decolonial, you know? So I think this is very important to understand. And today in the academia, many people are using decolonial terminology without doing our, the colonial practice without the politics and the ethics. They just use it as another framework to advance research. And that is uh, what is uh, happening today. And I've said it in several talks. I think uh, 
the coloniality is being skinned in a way that the four traders did. So taking the skin, the conceptual skin to dress up with it and leaving the organs to rot. And this is what's happening when you leave the ethics and the politics aside and you just take the conceptual apparatus. Um, this is one of the risks we are facing today with the appropriation of the colonial thinking. Now, what are the major tenets of uh, or propositions of the decolonial framework that I think most of us agree, or all of us, at least in our close network? So, first, coming from Quijano, no modernity without coloniality. There is no history of modernity without coloniality. That means there is no history of capitalism or Western civilization without the history of the plantation, of slavery, of racism, and, uh, and the degradation of verdicts, extraction. So, so in my work, I speak that the project of modernity is complicit with the loss of earth, earthlessness, and the loss of worlds, worthlessness. And it is not that it is a side effect, but that it is built on it. So we cannot have the European uh, way of life, the, the European palate, the taste, for example, for coffee, for chocolate, without that whole world historical structure of coloniality. So that's one part. The second uh, very important uh, premise is coming from Enrique Dussel and is the fact that we displaced the origin of modernity to 1492 symbolically. Because as Dussel explained, there is no idea of Europe at the center of the world and at the now of history without the conquest. Before 1492, Europe was a province in a multipolar world. And it is 1492 that produces a Europe that can uh, assign to itself this position of centrality. And as I say, as a present of history and as a hero of geography. And uh, so that cartography and the narration of the world will be centered in Europe. And you see it already. This is a, the beginning and what enables the formation of a Eurocentric Europe. So there is no Eurocentric Europe before colonialism. And um, so we today in the debates we are having, and I think we'll talk a bit more later in the conversation, we are struggling for a pluriversal Europe, a Europe that overcomes its Eurocentrism. That is a colonial formation. So decolonizing Europe doesn't mean that Europe had been conquered and its territory taken by others. Decolonizing Europe means undoing its Eurocentrism. That is a result of its colonial project, right? So the second premise then Modernity starts in 1492 and not in the Industrial Revolution or uh, Enlightenment but, or the Reformation or the French Revolution. But it's actually in the conquest of the world uh, that, uh, that Europe sees the possibility of understanding itself as the center of the world and is a possibility of Eurocentrism. Then, uh, third, uh, very important premise coming from the work of Maria Lugones. And I think it's very important to highlight that the, the decolonial uh, network and scholarship has many important uh, female or non-binary or lesbian authors, because normally it is accounted as the history of uh, three males you know, that found coloniality. And that is, I think, a very partial view on it. Uh, of course, Maria Lugones is fundamental for all of us. Um, and she brings about the, the idea of the coloniality of gender. And the coloniality of gender is a very powerful thinking that is 
based on Chicana feminism and black feminism, uh, where we can understand that colonialism, coloniality more precisely meant the intersection between race and gender in order to dehumanize others. So the border between humanity and dehumanization is the border marked by the coloniality of gender. So Maria Lugones brings an analysis that is based in the body, that is embodied, and that uh, enables us to see how modernity coloniality control bodies and subjectivities. Something that the systemic analysis of Kihan uh, or Dussel don't allow for. Then, uh, just to highlight that uh, it is fundamental for us also to, to think through the colonial gender. And also fundamental for aesthetics, I will explain later if we have the time. Then the coloniality is, a, I would call it the fourth premise, the coloniality is coming from the from Walter Mignolo, but also Sulma Palermo in Argentina, that speak about the linking, or in Spanish, desenganche. And the delinking means that the struggle to decolonize in terms of decoloniality is not just a struggle for national independence, as decolonization is, it is the and it is also not the struggle to become modern, to be included in the history of modernity. The coloniality is about the linking because its horizon is to go beyond uh, modernity, be beyond the modern colonial framework. So in a, in a decolonial perspective, the horizon is not to pluralize modernity and become a member of modern history, but actually uh, the horizon is pre-reversality, is to become other, to be to have the possibility of producing your own social historical reality. That um, so, and of course this comes a lot from the philosophies of Abya Yala, of First Nations and indigenous struggles that uh, have shown and thought about autonomy. Autonomia being we want to become ourselves and not just to be accepted by the state or by the dominant epistemology of the West. So why are we going to be human under the parameters, the dominant parameters that, ha that have been the ones that have made us inhuman? So liberation is not about entering that dominant paradigm, it's about overcoming it, and that is decoloniality. So I think for me, uh, these are the four main tenets. And then I will add your, your last question that, that becomes very important in particularly in, in what we have been writing. And that is the question of the colonial difference. The colonial difference is marked by this slash that you spoke about. So we write modernity slash coloniality. So the slash becomes the difference. And, and it is that um, that space or that time of questioning where there is um, a disjuncture that articulates the logic of modernity with the logic of coloniality, the logic of dominating representation, the presence of the world, world history, narratives, epistemologies, so the epistemic territory of modernity, and its articulation in a disjointed manner, so it's a disjointed articulation, uh, with the erasure, the absencing, the genocide, the extraction of other worlds of meaning and sense. So this is not a simple dialectics, but is something where uh, the colonial difference, as I say in the book, functions as a vortex. Um, it is not a simple dialectics where one is a positive side and there is a negative side. Uh, 
is actually a movement that uh, produces uh, centralizing power at the center of the vortex that um, that brings about a modernity that is based on the devastation of its outside. So if we so in the in the book, for example, I say I, I could read this little quote. One can picture the unfolding of the colonial difference as a raging vortex that takes into its hold, extirpating, eviscerating, rooting out all the all that lies under its sway. Earth, earth beings, communal bodies and worlds of meaning. Its giratory motion is made of concentric and eccentric forces. They at one and the same time extirpate and expel. They despoil. They appropriate by laying waste. The vortex of the colonial difference absorbs everything into the unfathomable abyss of empty time. It is instrumental from bringing the heritage of earth and of worlds of sensing and meaning into the hold of modernity's historical reality. Its hollow center, the empty now of modernity, is out of joint with the enduring absence of the colonial wound, the absence of what has been lost under its sway. So this is uh, one of the main preoccupations um, that led to the thinking of the colonial difference and is what is the relation between, let's say, the enjoyment of a bar of chocolate in the West, in a supermarket that is so cheap and gives instant enjoyment, uh, instant pleasure, and the suffering that is necessary for the production of that bar of chocolate. So it, it is a disjuncture of temporality, it's a temporality that is very ephemeral and superficial, but the empty time of the vortex that is the superficiality of desire that is connected in a disjointed way with a very deep suffering of those that are uh, giving their lives or, their, or whose lives are taken for producing it and the devastation of the rainforest that is also taken to produce it. So the wound is very long lasting, but the pleasure of consumption is just superficial. And this is uh, where you can see the image of the vortex showing the deep temporality of the wound and the task of healing it and uh, the task of justice that is not going away because it is open, uh, because the wound is open and the superficiality of a, of a way of consuming the world that is just thinking in the now and in a futurity, in an empty present. So that is, the, in very short, <laughs> the colonial difference explained as a movement of the vortex and why it is important to understand that connection between coloniality and modernity, not as a simple dialectics where one dominates the other in a simple manner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rolando. I, I wanted to, uh, now that we have all this, the constellation, let's say, of the key elements of the proposition, the modernity coloniality uh, system laid out and on the table, I would like to uh, to go to the book and and thank you for quoting because you know it's a very nice entry point I think to the discussion that you are proposing here, and I would like to go to the book by uh, especially looking at one of the main I think remits which is you. Um, uh, looking at the intersection of what you just described as being the colonial difference, which is very much as you, I mean, very much kind of, you know, 
uh, quoting you in a way, which is very much the, the, the proposition of excluding everything that is outside of the framework of modernity. So what you're doing here with, with the publication is to see the intersection between that gesture and regimes of visuality. And, and regimes of visuality that here include a very complex array of things, because you are not only thinking in terms of, for instance, um, exhibition practices, for instance, or artistic practices only. You are, I think, you are, you are um, um, setting up a, um, a genealogy, if if I may say, a genealogy from uh, that draws very strongly from the international colonial exhibitions in the nineteenth and twentieth century to today's, um, we could say, criteria of reading and practicing contemporary artistic, uh, con contemporary art. So, and hence, I think uh, in the subtitle of the book, uh, the end of the, of the contemporary, which, which I think it's very interesting and very provocative, definitely. So, so I think my question needs to focus on that intersection between modernity and the regimes of visuality, because I think the argument being uh, from, from your, uh, from your uh, argument in the book is that the colonial paradigm is not only visible or tangible, in the violence of the processes of extraction and exploitation, uh, but also necessarily in the spectacle of the international colonial exhibitions, for instance, practices of display. And what we could see here happening in your publication is how these exhibition and display practices inform the regimes of art history and also what we mean today by contemporary art. So I wanted to focus on the work you're doing here, specifically around representation and experience. Um, and I wanted to hear from you. I understood already that um, the, 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 your point around uh, the colonial not being an adjective that one can deploy lightly across the spectrum. Um, and, and you say that is more like a, a regime of an apparatus that people are using today very much in the field. But there are specificities to these practices. Um, so I think what I would like to hear from you is what, how you see these colonial artistic practices taking place and how they relate to that bigger uh, regime of visualities that was set up by modernity coloniality program. Okay, it's a very large question. Let me see if we can get there. Uh, I think first I would like to say that well, the question of aesthetics, the colonial is not just confined to the arts. Uh, of course, the arts are a focus of conversation when we're talking about aesthetics, but um, this conversation with artists or with art institutions is just one part of the discussion on aesthetics. Because what the what decolonizing aesthetics has brought about is that we need to, let's say, decolonize or to be concerned with the power over our experience of the world. And that is generally what we are understanding as aesthetics. Uh, the modern aesthetics are not just like the history of art or art practices, but are opening a field of conversation where we are beginning to understand how the experience of the world has been controlled. Our forms of experiencing reality. So in a way, uh, what we are talking about here is engaging with the question of the coloniality of aesthetics, and more broadly with the question of the coloniality of phenomenology. How we decolonize phenomenology? Or in which ways the modern colonial order has been dominant 
in the control of experience, over the control of experience, in the control of phenomenology. And, uh, and that expands uh, the field uh, incredibly because it goes beyond the discussion on political economic control that are very obvious, like imperial domination, state domination, uh, capitalist domination. So all that is, I think, uh, readily available with the thinking, for example, of Aníbal Quijano, and also with hand in hand with the Western social sciences. But when we begin thinking about the control of experience, of course, capitalism and the state and empire have a lot to do with it. But the way it circulates is not necessarily through the economy or through political apparatus, but it's through aesthetics. So, so in a way, we are making of aesthetics a field of inquiry to try to understand how experience has been controlled, how the access to the world, to our own lived reality, is being controlled by modernity coloniality. And that, as you can see, it's a very broad field where, of course, the arts become a place where we can inquire this, but they don't exhaust the question, right? Um, so, so, in this way, when we look at, for example, the colonial exhibitions or the world exhibitions, we see they are very good places to see how the dominant logic of representation is uh, is functioning under this modern colonial logic. You know, where on the one hand you have the celebration of modernity in terms of technology and progress and the machine and electricity and the elevator and all those, uh, like uh, I think Walter Benjamin said it clearly, like the, the world exhibitions were this uh, site for the, for commodity fetishism, for the, um, for people to go and, uh, and admire the machine, the commodity, all the discourse of progress and civilization. But they were also the place of coloniality. You know, they had all these human zoos and where they were exhibiting people from all over the world. And uh, they are also sitting at the origin of ethnographic exhibitions. And, um, and in this way, they, they constitute like a, I don't know exactly how to say, a sort of condensed space where you see the practice of the of the modern colonial gaze, uh, its production and its reproduction, what we will also call the practice of the white gaze. And here we are using the term whiteness in a very particular way, not in, an, in a racialized form, but actually in a form that positions whiteness as an actor in this modern colonial history. Because whiteness was the position of seeing and not the position of being seen, for example. Um, so, well, that's in general. Now the question, the question is how this how this form of representation or this dominant regime of representation is enmeshed with a temporality, with the temporality of modernity. So a bit already, I spoke already about the vortex where the ephemeral temporality of pleasure and consumption is disjointed with the temporality of suffering and the colonial wound. And in this way, in aesthetics or in the discourse of here, particularly the aesthetics of the arts, the contemporary will become a place of um, celebration of that temporality of modernity that says, uh, that states as its main criteria of validation being in the time of the now. And that time of the now is a time that is possible through power. 
So that's why we speak about uh, when we decolonize aesthetics, we need to go beyond the contemporary. We don't want the post-contemporary, we want the end of the contemporary. We want the end of a temporal regime that says we are in the present and we have the authority to say who is in the present. Because even when you globalize the contemporary, what you are doing is just to extend the criteria of who is in the present, but you are not really allowing for different temporalities, for different forms of experience in the world as um, as valid. So that is uh, broadly what the the end of the contemporary is bringing about, and as a call to decolonize aesthetics and the and its, its temporality. I think I think a, a very um also thought-provoking connection you are making in the publication is in relation to aesthetics is as you mentioned this is this, it doesn't get exhausted within the realm of artistic practices it's a it's a broader framework um, and at some point you say that you understand aesthetics as um, as also a domain of social life and i'm quoting you as the domain of social life equivalent to epistemologies and i think this is this is incredibly provoking for both realms say aesthetics on one hand but also for epistemologies um, and you are kind of bringing together, I understand, by making this just a position um, and, and bringing them together within this umbrella of social life, you are actually making them way more mundane in a positive way, way more mundane than one, what we think at the first glance about epistemologies in aesthetics. And so if we stick to these two, say, realms or paradigms, aesthetics and, and um, epistemologies, epistemologies. I wanted to move to my last question um, that very much, uh, um, very much uh, addresses another point in the publication around what you call culture and educational institutions. And this obviously resonates with aesthetics and epistemologies as you're just, uh, uh, as I, I was just kind of focusing in this introduction to this question. So, so there's a lot of work here. There's a lot of work you've been doing personally as well uh, in, the context, in the context of the Netherlands and beyond in terms of the say more political work uh, with together with institutions uh, such as University of Amsterdam in the report I mentioned, mentioned in your introduction, in the introduction to your uh, bio, but also the work you've recently done together with the formerly uh, named Vita de Viet, today uh, Mali, uh, so Contemporary Art Center in Rotterdam. So we're talking about two different, very different, we could say, kinds of institutions, but it's interesting how you're bringing them together, because I think that's the point, is that aesthetics and epistemologies are not meant to be situated separately, but actually part of the same process of understanding and making worlds. So I wanted, I wanted to ask you, what's the role of these institutions today? Because as we've seen in a growing um, contestation process, let's say, of uh, what happened since 2020, mainly not exclusively, because this has been obviously an ongoing debate, uh, but we definitely see these institutions being more and more under scrutiny uh, and being a call to, uh, uh, be accountable uh, for their, not only their contemporary practices, but also the legacies they hold on to. So, so what's the work here? I know this is a massive question, but if you could draw mm -hmm. on some of the propositions you present in the publication in terms of what's at stake in this institutional transition as uh, Arturo Escobar has, has um, argued. Okay, this is also a very long question. <laughs> I will try to go into it. Um, well, first, let me start with the, the relation between epistemology and aesthetics. I mean, the argument is precisely to bring them together in, in the decolonial practice. 
to bring together the efforts to decolonize epistemology with decolonizing aesthetics. Why? Because in in the last 10, 20 years, the discussions on decolonizing epistemologies have been very advanced. So, I mean, from people like Mignolo to people like Santos, um, to black radical thought. So there is a very important um, awareness and acknowledgement today that epistemology needs to be decolonized and that that's the control of knowledge. But this discussion has rarely or seldomly taken into consideration aesthetics. And that's why one of the arguments is in the book is we need to do the same level of work we have been doing with epistemologies with aesthetics because they don't cover the same. That doesn't mean that they are separated. That means they are related, but they need, we need to do the work in, in the aesthetic side that corresponds to what we have been doing in the epistemic side. And um, so we don't have as much vocabulary developed and as much knowledge in uh, aesthetics and decolonizing aesthetics than we have in epistemology. And of course, epistemology is centering in terms of knowledge and the structures of knowledge and uh, forgetting this part of the control of experience, the control of phenomenology, the control of how we experience the world. That is the control that goes through aesthetics that is obviously sustained by a system of knowledge, but the system of knowledge doesn't show you what the aesthetic shows you when you question it. And so other ways in which power is circulating, in which coloniality is circulating. Um, so that is uh, to say that we are not advocating for a separation of the two. We are advocating for a conjunction because the discussion on epistemologies have often forgotten aesthetics and has been said that in knowledges, and those again replicating the separation between mind and body, this modern dichotomic separation that many people attribute to Descartes, but obviously comes from before. But so, so we cannot just undo epistemologies without undoing aesthetics. That would be the, the main point. And so here going towards what happens with institutions today, um, Yes, I, I think the work of Arturo Escobar, speaking of transitions, it's very important. And the idea that we can produce transformations and uh, that are situated. So the work with institutions is not the center of the coloniality. It is a work of, um, a, a work that needs to be done in, uh, because institutions continue to be complicit with reproducing the colonial wound and with reproducing all forms of epistemic and aesthetic violence. And we need to make them accountable to that. And so that is a work which in our local struggles is important. But that is not to say these institutions will save the world or, or that the struggle to transform institutions is more important than other struggles. Actually, I, I am sure it's the reverse. I think other struggles are more important. The struggles that are being led by First Nations and Indigenous peoples uh, to preserve the earth are at the forefront, to preserve their languages. So, so, so I want to clarify this because we are not recentering institutions we are dealing with them because they are responsible for reproducing a lot of violence and they need to be held accountable. And we do think it's possible that they do a different work. So, um, so for example, the university can have uh, spaces where the students uh, learn more than the Eurocentric perspectives that they go beyond this arrogant ignorance of Eurocentrism, where they become aware of their position in the world as 
university of things in the global north, for example, aware of the position in the world in relation to the colonial difference. So a lot of things can happen concretely in the institutions. That is not to say that the university will stop being a modern colonial project by doing that, but it can change, right? It can do meaningful work. And the same for museums and galleries and art institutes. So what is involved here? Well, in the Netherlands, we're in a very important moment. And I think something like that is also happening in England from what I understand and in other places. And is that there is a conjunction between a very strong activism that is aware of the structures of coloniality, particularly racism and and racism crossed by gender, so intersec an intersectional understanding of social inequality and social injustice. And this activism that is coming from youth uh, is encountering, uh, in this case, the coloniality that is a framework of knowledge and understanding uh, and of advocacy that um, that coincides with their understanding of what they are suffering and what they want society to be about, what they want to change. And this encounter between a very powerful activism that is aware of these problems in society and a very now solid and developed framework, I think, of thinking um, is enabling institutional transformations. So for example, uh, the they call Kunst Institute Meli, uh, but that was named with the name of a, that will, I will not repeat, but a name of a, um, of a commander or a high officer of the, of the colonial companies of the Netherlands. That name became untenable in a society that is be beginning to be aware of its history a history that was never taught in schools, but that society is remembering and is bringing about, especially the people that suffered the legacies of that history with today's discrimination, today's form of racism and sexism. Um, so what you see is that the scholarship, people like Walter Mignol and Maria Lugones have been doing for many decades reaches a moment where it encountered those movements. And then those movements, those movements uh, uh, become um, also reinforced with that knowledge. Because we, like in the diversity report for the, for the University of Amsterdam, we could uh, say with very clear uh, scientific argumentation why the university is untenable as it is. And that coincided with the demands of the movement. So in a way, we, we could uh, join forces. So it's a possibility that was not there before. This is a very particular moment, I think, where this is being possible. And basically, um, we are seeing how the museum, the university, have been complicit with reproducing the colonial difference, have been complicit with coloniality with reproducing the white gaze, a gaze that uh, consumes the world without recognizing uh, its own responsibility for, for the social injustice that is breaking apart our society and for the earth injustice that is bringing us to climate collapse. So, so now, just very briefly, we think it is these transformations require a multi-level approach, which would include who is in the institutions and in which stages of the institutions, so in which hierarchy in the institutions. So who is leading the institution, who is cleaning the institution. I always say to my students, well, look at the big university and look at who is on top and who is at the bottom and you will see the colonial society. And uh, so this is 
untenable if we want to adjust an open society today. Uh, second, so who and who is in the classroom, of course, who has access, who are the artists collected, who are the artists presented, uh, who are the curators, who are the directors. So all this question of the who is very important. And of, of course, also the question for whom, you know, for who is this knowledge we are teaching? Is it to accumulate knowledge, to reproduce the power that generates inequality? or is it for others and for social justice? Um, then the question is, the second question we raise is the what? What are we researching? What are we producing? What are we teaching? What is the curriculum? What is the canon of art history? What is the framework of representation? And that also needs to change. And the third level is, uh, the how, how we go about it. Because we have examples of teachers having a non-white canon, let's say they are teaching poetry from the Caribbean, for example, but they teach it in a racist way. So we also need to change the way of doing, the ethics of doing, so the orientation. Many people, as I started to talk today, uh, many people, um, are using decolonial terminology, but they are not using it with a decolonial politics or a decolonial ethics. And so if you don't change the how, then it just becomes a vocabulary that furthers the colonial division. You can further the colonial division using decolonial terminology. So, uh, so I think for me, one of the central issues I've been raising for many years now is that we need to address the ethical question and it's a question of whether we can live an ethical life in a world in which our well-being is made dependent on the suffering of others and on the destruction of earth. So for me, that question encapsulates that uh, the modern way of life that makes us that makes our forms of success, of enjoyment, of pleasure, of a sense of self, that makes all those things dependent on the suffering of others and on the destruction of earth is, is untenable. And, uh, and it is an ethical question that we need to address. And by addressing it, it doesn't mean we are, we can find a safe place for us, it means we have to start from the awareness that we are implicated in that violence. So I think that is the, the colonial position that is about the humbling of modernity and about recognizing that we are all implicated in some way or another. And that uh, there is no, as Maria Lucones would say, there is no position of purity to claim an authority or to claim uh, that we are not involved in that in that violence or in that in those forms of coloniality mm -hmm. we have to start from the premise that we are involved and what we do from there from mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. so it's a, a sort of the end of that abstract innocence or what uh, maria calls purity the position of purity mm -hmm. or gleason calls the position of transparency mm -hmm. we need to move beyond that that uh, modern colonial retention of innocence into a more uh, engaged and humble uh, politics and doing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, super, super interesting. Uh, I was thinking also in terms of that those notions of purity and or better said the pitfalls of notions of purity and transparency in relation to the capture of experience and how that sense of experience that we see also in academia in relation to ethnography uh, very much uh, plays out in a very particular way as if the subject has access to its experience and can therefore um, can therefore work on it and about it as being kind of a matter of knowledge production. And I think there's also very interesting, I think, intersections there. Uh, Rolando, um, 
we've, uh, I feel like we only touched the surface uh, in terms of what this book is bringing uh, to the discussion. Uh, I would like to say that I hope that we have more opportunities to engage in conversations to touch on the other uh, very interesting uh, topics that you mentioned in your book, uh, but also to finally thank you for your time and for accepting the invitation and also talking us through some of the very complex notions that you are bringing together with your work and also again in this publication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you, Carolina.